Chapter 24, Industry Comes of Age, 1865 to 1900. As the 19th century drew to a close, observers were asking, why are the best men not in politics? One answer was that they were being lured away from public life by the lusty attractions of the booming private economy. As America's industrial revolution slipped into high gear, talented men ached for profits, not the presidency. They dreamed of controlling corporations, not the Congress. What the nation lost in civic leadership, it gained in an astounding surge of economic growth. Although in many ways still a political dwarf, the United States was about to stand up before the world as an industrial colossus, and the lives of millions of working Americans would be transformed in the process. The iron colt becomes an iron horse. The government business entanglements that increasingly shaped politics after the Civil War also undergirded the industrial development of the nation. The unparalleled outburst of railroad construction was a crucial case. When Lincoln was shot in 1865, there were only 35,000 miles of steam railways in the United States, mostly east of the Mississippi. By 1900, the figure had spurted up to 192,000 556 miles, or more than that of all of Europe combined, and much of the new trackage ran west of the Mississippi. Transcontinental railroad building was so costly and risky as to require government subsidies. The extension of rails into thinly populated regions was unprofitable until the areas could be built up, and private promoters were unwilling to suffer heavy initial losses. Congress, impressed by arguments and pleadings by uh, military and postal needs, began to advance liberal money loans to two favored cross-continent companies in 1862 and added enormous donations of acreage paralleling the tracks. All told, Washington rewarded the railroads with 155,504,994 acres, and the western states contributed 49 million more, a total area larger than Texas. These are giveaways to railroads to encourage them to spend the money and risk building these railroads. If you take a look at the map on page 529, you can see what they're talking about. Grasping railroads tied up even more land than this for a number of years. Land grants to railroads were made in the broad belts along the, prosperous, the proposed route. Within these belts, the railroads were allowed to choose alternative square miles uh, in sections in a checkerboard fashion. See the map above. But until they determined the precise location of their tracks and decided which sections were the choicest selections, the railroad withheld all the land from other users. President Grover Cleveland put an end to this foot-dragging practice in 1887 and threw open the settlement to the still unclaimed public portions of the land-grant areas. Noisy criticism, especially in later years, was leveled at the giveaway of so valuable a birthright to greedy corporations, but the government did receive beneficial returns, including long-term preferential rates for postal service and military traffic. Granting land was also a cheap way to subsidize a much-desired transportation system because it avoided new taxes for direct cra uh, cra cash grants. The railroads could turn land into gold by using it as collateral for loans from private bankers or later by selling it. This they often did at an average price of $3 an acre. Critics were often prone to overlook uh, the fact that the land did not have even that relatively modest value until the railroads had ribboned it with steel. Frontier villages touched by the magic wand of the iron rail became flourishing cities. Those that became bypassed were often withered away and became ghost towns. Little wonder that communities fought one another for the privilege of playing host to the railroads. Ambitious towns customarily held, held out monetary and other attractions to the builders, who sometimes blackmailed them into contributing more generously. Spanning the continent with rails. Deadlock in the 1850s over the proposed transcontinental railroad was broken when the South seceded, leaving the field to the North. In 1862, the year after the guns first spoke at Fort Sumner, Congress made provisions for starting the long-awaited line. One weighty argument for action was the urgency of bolstering the Union, already disrupted, by binding the Pacific Coast, especially Goldridge, California, more securely to the rest of the Republic. The Union Pacific Railroad, uh, note the word Union, was thus commissioned by Congress to thrust westward from Omaha, Nebraska. For each mile of track constructed, the company was granted 20 square miles of land, alternating in 640-acre sections on either side of the track. For each mile, the builders were also to receive a generous federal loan ranging from $16,000 on the flat prairie land to 48000 for mountainous country. The laying of rails began in earnest after the Civil War ended in 1865, and with juicy loans and land grants available, the groundhog promoters made all possible haste. Insiders of the Credit Mobile Construction Company reaped fabulous profits. They slyly pocketed $73 million for some $50 million worth of breakneck construction, spending small change to bribe the congressmen to look the other way.
sweaty construction gangs containing many Irish paddies, Patricks, who had fought in the Union armies, worked at a frantic pace. On one record-breaking day, a sledge and shovel army of some 5,000 men laid 10 miles of track. A favorite song was, Then drill my paddies drill, drill my heroes drill, drill all day, no sugar in your tay, working on the UP railway. When hostile Indians attacked in futile efforts to protect what was once rightfully been their land, the laborers would drop their picks and seize their rifles. Scores of men, railroad workers, and Indians lost their lives as the rails stretched over ever westward. At Rail's End, workers tried their best to find relaxation and conviviality in their tented towns known as Hell on Wheels, often teeming with as many as 10,000 men and a sprinkling of painted prostitutes and performers. Rail laying at the California end was undertaken by the Central Pacific Railroad. This line pushed boldly eastward from Boomtown, Sacramento, over and through the towering snow-clogged Sierra Nevada. Four far-seeing men, the so-called Big Four, were the chief financial backers of the enterprise. The quartet including the heavyset enterprising ex-governor Leland Stanford of California, who had useful political connections, and the burly, energetic Collis P. Huntington, an adept lobbyist. The Big Four cleverly operated through two construction companies, and although they walked away with tens of millions of profits, they kept their hands relatively clean by not becoming involved in the bribery of congressmen. The Central Pacific, which was granted the same princely subsidies as the Union Pacific, had the same incentive to haste. Some 10,000 Chinese laborers, sweating from dawn to dusk under their basket hats, proved to be cheap, efficient, and expendable. Hundreds lost their lives in premature explosions and other mishaps. The towering Sierra Nevada presented a formidable barrier, and the nerves of the Big Four were strained when their workers could chip away only a few inches a day uh, tunneling through solid rock, while the Union Pacific was sledgehammering westward across the open plains. A wedding of the rails was finally consummated near Ogden, Utah in 1869, as two locomotives, facing on a single track, half a world behind each, uh, each back, gently kissed cowcatchers. The colorful ceremony included the breaking of champagne bottles and drinking, I'm sorry, driving of the last ceremonial Golden Spike, with ex-governor Leland Stanford clumsily wielding a silver sledgehammer. In all, the Union Pacific built 1,886 miles and the Central Pacific 689 miles. Completion of the transcontinental line, a magnificent engineering feat for that day, was one of America's most impressive peacetime undertakings. It welded the West Coast more firmly to the Union and facilitated a flourishing trade with Asia. It penetrated the arid barrier of the deserts, paving the way for the phenomenal growth of the Great West. Americans compared this electrifying achievement with the Declaration of Independence and the emancipation of the slaves. Jubilant Philadelphians again rang the cracked bell at Independence Hall binding the country with railroad ties. With the westward trail now blazed, four other transcontinental lines were completed before the century's end. None of them secured monetary loans from the federal government, as did the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, but all of them except the Great Northern received generous grants of land. The Northern Pacific Railroad, stretching from Lake Superior to Puget Sound, reached its terminus in 1883. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, stretching through the southwestern deserts to California, was completed in 1884. The Southern Pacific ribboned from New Orleans to San Francisco and was consolidated in the same year. The last bike of the last five transcontinental railroads of the 19th century was hammered home in 1893. The Great Northern, which ran from Duluth to Seattle, north to the Northern Pacific, was the creation of a far-visioned Canadian-American James J. Hill, a bear-like man who was probably the greatest railroad builder of all. Endowed with a high sense of public duty, he perceived that the prosperity of this railroad depended upon the prosperity of the area that it served. He ran agricultural demonstration trains through the hill country and imported from England blooded bulls which he distributed to the farmers. His enterprise was so soundly organized that it rode through later financial storms with flying colors. Yet the romance of the rails was not without its sordid side. Pioneer builders were often guilty of gross over-optimism. Avidly seeking land bounties and pushing into areas that lacked enough potential population to support a railroad, they sometimes laid down rails that led from nowhere to nothing. When prosperity failed to smile upon their coming, they went into bankruptcy, carrying down them with the savings of trusting investors. Many of the large railroads in the post-Civil War decades passed through seemingly endless bankruptcies, mergers, and reorganizations. Railroad Consolidation and Mechanization Success of the Western Lines was facilitated by welding together the expanding and expanding the older Eastern networks, notably the New York Central. The genius in this enterprise was Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, burly, boisterous, white-whiskered, 
Having made his millions in steamboating, he daringly turned in his late 60s to a news career in railroading. Though ill-educated, ungrammatical, coarse, and ruthless, he was clear-visioned. Offering superior railway service at lower rates, he amassed a fortune of $100 million. His name is perhaps best remembered through his contribution of $1 million to the founding of Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. Two significant new improvements proved a boon to the railroads. One was the steel rail, which Vanderbilt helped popularize when he replaced the old iron tracks of the New York Central with the tougher metal. Steel was safer and more economical because it could bear a heavier load. A standard gauge of track width, track width likewise came into wide use during the post-war years, thus eliminating the expense and inconvenience of numerous changes from one line to another. Other refinements played a vital role in railroading. The Westinghouse air brake, generally adopted in the 1870s, was a marvelous contribution to efficiency and safety. The Pullman Palace cars, advertised as gorgeous traveling hotels, were introduced on a considerable scale in the 1860s. Alarmists condemned them as wheels, wheeled torture chambers and potential funeral pyres, for the wooden cars were equipped with swaying kerosene lamps. Appalling accidents continued to be almost daily tragedies, despite, fire, sorry, despite safety devices like the telegraph, talking wires, and double talking, and later double tracking, and later the block signal. Revolution by railways: the metallic fingers of the railroads intimately touched countless phases of American life. For the first time, a sprawling nation became united in a physical sense, bound with ribs of iron and steel. By stitching North America together from ocean to ocean, the transcontinental lines created an enormous domestic market for American raw materials and manufactured goods, probably the largest integrated national market area in the world. This huge empire of commerce beckoned to foreign and domestic investors alike, as well as to business people who could now dare to dream on a continental scale. It created a massive domestic market. More than any other single factor, the railroad spurred network spurred the amazing industrialization of the post-Civil War years. The puffing locomotives opened up fresh markets for manufactured goods and sped raw materials to factories. The forging of these rails themselves generated the largest single source of orders for the adolescent steel industry. The screeching iron horse likewise stimulated mining and agriculture, especially in the West. It took farmers out to the land, carried the fruits of their toil to market, and brought them manufactured necessities. Clusters of farm settlements paralleled the railroads, just as earlier they had followed the rivers. Railways were a boon for cities and played a leading role in the great cityward movement of the last decade of the century. The iron monsters could carry food to enormous concentrations of people and at the same time ensure them a livelihood by providing both raw materials and markets. Railroad companies also stimulated the mighty steam stream of immigration. Seeking settlers to whom their land grants might be sold at profit, they advertised seductively in Europe and sometimes offered to transport the newcomers free to their farms. The land also felt the impact of the railroad, especially the broad, ecological, fragile midsection of the continent that Thomas Jefferson had purchased from France in 1803. Settlers following the railroads plowed up the tall grass prairies of Iowa, Illinois, Kansas, and Nebraska, and planted well-drained rectangular cornfields. On the short grass prairies of the high plains in the Dakotas and the Montana range, uh, range-fed cattle rapidly displaced the buffalo, which were hunted to near extinction. The white pine forests of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota disappeared into lumber that was rushed by rail to prairie farmers who used them to build houses and fences. Time itself was bent to the railroads of need. Until the 1880s, every town in the U.S. had its own local time, dictated by the sun's position. When it was noon in Chicago, it was 11.50 a.m. in St. Louis and 12.18 in Detroit, and 12 p.m. in Detroit. For railroad operators worried about keeping schedules and avoiding wrecks, this patchwork of local times was a nightmare. Thus, on November 18, 1883, the major rail lines decreed that the continent would be henceforth divided into four time zones. Most communities quickly adopted railroad standard time. Finally, the railroad, more than any other single factor, was the maker of millionaires. A raw new aristocracy consisting of lords of the rail replaced the old southern lords of the lash. The multi-webbed lines became playthings of Wall Street, and colossal wealth was amassed by stock speculators and railroad wreckers. Wrongdoing in railroading. Corruption lurks nearby when fabulous fortunes can materialize overnight. The fleecings administered by the railroad construction companies, such as the Credit Mobilier, were but the first of the bunco games that railroad promoters learned to play. Methods soon became more refined as fast-fingered financiers executed multi-million dollar maneuvers beneath the noses of a bedazzled public. Jay Gould was the most adept of these ringmasters of rapacity. 
For nearly 30 years, he boomed and busted the stocks of the Erie, the Kansas Pacific, and the Union Pacific, and the Texas and Pacific, in an incredible circus of speculative skullduggery. One of the favorite devices of the moguls of manipulation was stock watering. The term originally referred to the practice of making cattle thirsty by feeding them salt, and then having them bloat themselves with water before they were weighed in for scale. Using a variation of this technique, railroad stock promoters grossly inflated their claims about a given line's assets and profitability, and sold stocks and bonds far in excess of the railroad's actual value. Promoters' profits were often the tail that wagged the iron horse itself. Railroad managers were forced to charge extortionate, extortionate rates and wage ruthless competitive battles in order to pay off the exaggerated financial obligations with which they were saddled. The public interest was frequently trampled underfoot as the railroad titans waged their brutal wars. Crusty old Cornelius Vanderbilt, when told that the law stood in his way, reportedly exclaimed, Law? What do I care about the law? Hain't I got the power? On another occasion, he supposedly threatened some associates. I won't sue you, for the law is too slow. I'll ruin you. His son, William H. Vanderbilt, when asked in 1883 about the discontinuance of the fast mail train, reportedly snorted, The public be damned. While abusing the public, the railroad blandly bought and sold people in public life. They bribed judges and legislatures, employed arm-twisting lobbyists, and elected their own creatures of high office. They showered free passes on journalists and politicians in profusion. One railway man noted in 1885 that in the West, no man who has money or official position or influence thinks he ought to pay anything for riding on a railroad. Railroad kings were, for a time, virtual industrial monarchs. As manipulators of a huge natural monopoly, they exercised more direct control over the lives of more people than did the President of the United States, and their terms were not limited to four years. They increasingly shunned the crude bloodletting of cutthroat competition and began to cooperate with one another to rule the railroad dominion. Sorely pressed to show at least some returns on their bloated investments, they entered into defensive alliances to protect their precious profits. The earliest form of combination was the pool, an agreement to divide the business in a given area and share the profits. Other rail barons granted secret rebates or kickbacks to powerful shippers in return for steady and assured traffic. Often they slashed their rates on competing lines, but they more than made up the difference on non-competing ones, where they might actually charge more for a short haul than for a long one. Government bridles the iron horse. It was neither healthy nor politically acceptable that so many people should be at the mercy of so few. Impoverished farmers, especially in the Midwest, began to wonder if the nation had not escaped from slavery power only to fall into the hands of the money power as represented by the railroad plutocracy. But the American people, through quick to, though quick to respond to political injustice, were slow to combat economic injustice. Dedicated to free enterprise and to the principle that competition is the soul of trade, they cherished a traditionally keen pride in progress. They remembered that Jefferson's ideals were hostile to government interference with business. Above all, there shimmered the American dream, the hope that in a catch-as-catch-can economy, uh, economic system, anyone might become a millionaire. It might be you that becomes a millionaire, so why mess with the system? The depressions of the late 1870s finally goaded the farmers into protesting against being railroaded into bankruptcy. Under pressure from organized agrarian groups like the Grange, the patrons of husbandry, Many Midwestern legislatures tried to regulate the railroad monopoly. This is an important case coming up, so you might want to remember this one. The scattered state efforts screeched to a halt in 1886. The Supreme Court, in the famed Wabash case, decreed that individual states had no power to regulate interstate commerce. If the mechanical monster were to be corralled, the federal government would have to do the job. So states would try to regulate the railroads, but they would say, nope, that's interstate trade, you can't regulate that. Supreme Court, Wabash case. Stiff-necked President Cleveland did not look kindly on effective regulation, but Congress ignored his grumbling indifference and passed the epical Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. It prohibited rebates and pools and required the railroads to publish their rates openly. It also forbade unfair discrimination against shippers and outlawed charging more for a short haul than for a long one over the same line. Most important, it set up the Interstate Commerce Commission to administer and enforce new legislation. The Interstate Commerce Act, which in, uh, regulates the railroads, and uh, it is monitored by the Interstate Commerce Commission. Despite a claim, the Interstate Commerce Act emphatically did not represent a popular victory over corporate wealth. One of the leading corporation lawyers of the day, Richard Olney, shrewdly noted that the new commission, quote, can be made of great use to the railroads. It satisfies the popular clamor for a government supervision of railroads, at the same time that such supervision is almost entirely nominal. 
The part of wisdom is not to destroy the commission, but to utilize it. Basically, it puts a bandit on it, people think something's being done, and the railroad men can manipulate and control the commission. What the new legislation did do was to provide an orderly form where competing business interests could resolve their conflicts in peaceable ways. The country could now avoid ruinous rate wars among the railroads and outrage, uh, and outrage confiscatory attacks on the lines by pitchfork parted state legislatures. This was a modest accomplishment, but by no means an unimportant one. The Interstate Commerce Act tended to stabilize, not revolutionize, the existing business system. Yet the act still ranks as a red-letter law. It was the first large-scale attempt by Washington to regulate business in the interest of society at large. It heralded the arrival of a series of independent regulatory commissions in the next century, which would irrevocably commit the government to daunting tasks of monitoring and guiding the private economy. It foreshadowed the doom of freewheeling buccaneering business practices and served full notice that there was a public interest in private enterprise that the government was bound to protect. So this here, just a quick pause, is not laissez-faire, right? It's the first challenge to the idea of laissez-faire government, uh, laissez-faire business where the government will step in even though it's not all that big. Miracles of Mechanization Post-war industrial expansion, partly as a result of the railroad network, rapidly began to assume mammoth proportions. When Lincoln was elected in 1860, the Republic ranked only fourth among the manufacturing nations of the world. By 1894, it had bounded into first place. Why the sudden upsurge? Keep note, guys. Keep, take note of this. Liquid capital, previously scarce, was now becoming abundant. The word millionaire had not been coined until the 1840s, and in 1861, only a handful of individuals were eligible for this class. But the Civil War, partly through profiteering, created immense fortunes, and these accumulations could now be combined with the customary borrowings from foreign capitalists. Liquid capital, by the way, is money, capital to be invested, that is, just sitting, waiting for someone to spend it. The amazing natural resources of the nation were now about to be fully exploited, including coal, oil, and iron. For example, the Minnesota Lake Superior region, which had yielded some iron ore by the 1850s, contributed to the rich deposits of the Mesabi Range by the 1890s. This priceless bonanza, where mountains of red rusted ore could be scooped up by steam shovels, ultimately became a cornerstone of a vast steel empire. Massive immigration helped make unskilled labor cheap and plentiful. Steel, the keystone industry, built its strength largely on the sweat of low-priced immigrant labor from Eastern and Southern Europe, working in two 12-hour shifts seven days a week. American ingenuity at the same time played a vital role in the second American Industrial Revolution. Techniques of mass production, pioneered by Eli Whitney, were being perfected by the captains of industry. American inventiveness flowered luxuriantly in the post-war years. Between 1860 and 1890, some 440,000 patents were issued. Business operations were facilitated by such machines as the cash register, the stock ticker, and the typewriter, literary piano it was called, which attracted women from the confines of the home to industry. Urbanization was speeded by the refrigerator car, the electric dynamo, and the electric railway, which displaced animal-drawn cars. One of the most ingenious inventions was the telephone, introduced by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. A teacher of the deaf who was given a dead man's ear to experiment with he remarked that if he could make the mute talk, he could make the iron speak. America was speedily turning into a nation of telephoni telephoniacs, as a giant communication network was built on his invention. The social impact of this instrument was further revealed when an additional army of number please women was attracted from the stove to the switchboard. Telephone boys were at first employed as operators, but their profanity shocked patrons. The most versatile inventor of all was Thomas Alva Edison who as a boy had been considered too dull-witted that he was uh, taken out of school. His severe deafness enabled him to concentrate without distraction. Edison was a gifted tinkerer and a tireless worker, not a pure scientist. Genius, he said, is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Wondrous devices poured out of his, quote, invention factory in New Jersey. The phonograph, which is a record player, the mimeograph, it's like the photocopier, uh, the dictaphone, and the moving picture. He is probably best known for his perfection in 1879 of the electric light bulb, which he unveiled after experimenting with some 6,000 different filaments. The electric light turned night into day and transformed ancient human habits as well. People had previously slept on average of nine hours a night. Now they slept just a bit more than seven hours. The Trust Titan Emerges Despite pious protests to the contrary, competition was the bugbear of most business leaders of the day means they don't like it. Tycoons like Andrew Carnegie, the Steel King, John D. Rockefeller, the Oil Baron, and J. Pierre, 
Pierpont Morgan, J.P. Morgan, the banker's banker, exercised their genius in devising ways to circumvent competition, go around it. Carnegie integrated every phase of his steelmaking operation. His miners scratched the ore from the earth in the Misabi Range. Carnegie ships floated it across the Great Lakes. Carnegie railroads delivered it into uh, it to the blast furnaces of Pittsburgh. When the molten metal finally poured from the glowing crucibles into the waiting ingot molds, no other hands but those in Carnegie's employed an employee had touched the product. Carnegie thus pioneered the creative entrepreneurial tactic of vertical integration, combining into one organization all the phases of manufacturing from mining to marketing. His goal was to improve efficiency by making supplies more reliable, controlling the quality of the product at all stages of production, and eliminating middleman's fees. Less justifiable on grounds of efficiency was the technique of horizontal integration which simply meant allying with competitors to monopolize a given market. Rockefeller was the master of this stratagem. He perfected a device for controlling bothersome rivals, the trust. Stockholders in various smaller oil companies assigned their stock to the board of directors of his Standard Oil Company, formed in 1870. It then consolidated and concerted the operations of the previously competing enterprises. Let us pray was said to be Rockefeller's unwritten motto. Pray as in like you know, kill your prey. Uh, ruthlessly wielding vast power, Standard Oil soon cornered virtually the entire world petroleum market. Weaker competitors, left out of the trust agreement, were forced to the wall. Rockefeller's stunning success <clears throat> inspired many imitators, and the word trust became generally used to describe any large-scale business combination. The Imperial Morgan, J.P. Morgan, devised still other schemes for eliminating, quote, wasteful competition. The Depression of the 1890s, drove into his welcoming arms many bleeding business people wounded by cutthroat competition. His prescribed remedy was to consolidate rival enterprises and to ensure future harmony by placing officers of his own banking syndicate on their various boards of directors. These came to be known as interlocking directorates. They don't like competition. Vertical, horizontal integration and in interlocking directorates. The Supremacy of Steel. Steel is king might have been the exulting war cry of the new industrial generation. The mighty metal ultimately held together the new steel civilization, from skyscrapers to skull scuttles, while providing it with food, shelter, and transportation. Steelmaking, notably rails for railroads, typified the dominance of heavy industry, which concentrated on making capital goods, as distinct from producing consumer goods, such as clothes and shoes. Now taken for granted, steel was a scarce commodity in the wooden brick America of Abraham Lincoln. Considerable iron went into railroad rails and bridges, but steel was expensive and was used largely for products like cutlery. The early iron horse snorted exclusively and dangerously over iron rails. When in the 1870s Commodore Vanderbilt of the New York Central began using steel rails, he was forced to import them from Britain. Yet within an amazing 20 years, the United States had outdistanced all foreign competitors and was pouring out more than a third of the world's supply of steel. By 1900, America was producing as much as Britain and Germany combined. What wrought this transformation? Chiefly the invention in the 1850s of a method of making cheap steel, the Bessemer process. It was named after a derided British inventor, although an American had stumbled on it a few years earlier. William Kelly, a Kentucky manufacturer of iron kettles, discovered that cold air blown on red-hot iron caused the metal to become white-hot by igniting the carbon and thus eliminating impurities. He tried to apply the new air boiling technique to his own product, but his customers decried Kelly's fool steel, and his business declined. Gradually, the Bessemer-Kelly process won acceptance, and these two crazy men ultimately made possible the present steel civilization. A revolutionary steel fabricating process was not the whole story. America was one of the few places in the world where one could find relatively close together abundant coal for fuel, rich iron ore for smelting, and other essential ingredients for making steel. The nation also boasted an abundant labor supply guided by industrial know-how of a high order. The stage was set for miracles of production. Carnegie and Other Sultans of Steel Kingpin among steel masters was Andrew Carnegie, an understized, charming Scotsman. As a tow-headed lad of 13, he was brought to America by his impoverished parents in 1848 and got a job as a bobbin boy at $1.20 a week. Mounting the ladder of success so fast that he was said to have scorched the rungs, he forged ahead by working hard, doing the extra chore, cheerfully assuming responsibility, and smoothly cultivating influential people. Smoothly cultivating influential people. Kissing up. After accumulating some capital, Carnegie entered the steel business in the Pittsburgh area. 
a gift to organizer and administrator, he succeeded by picking high-class associates and by eliminating many middlemen. Although inclined to be tough-fisted in business, he was not a monopolist and disliked monopolistic trusts. His remarkable organization was a partnership that involved, at its maximum, about 40 Pittsburgh millionaires. By 1900, he was producing one-fourth of the nation's Bessemer steel, and the partners were dividing profits of $40 million a year, with the Napoleon of the smokestacks himself receiving a cool $25 million. These were the pre-income tax days when millionaires made real money and profits represented take-home pay. There was no income tax back then. Into the picture now stepped the financial giant of the age, J.P. Juniper Morgan. And, and he, uh, sorry, Morgan had his, made his legendary reputation for himself and his Wall Street banking house by financing the reorganization of railroads, insurance companies, and banks. An impressive, impressive figure of a man with massive shoulders, shaggy brows, piercing eyes, and a bulbous acne-cursed red nose, he had established an enviable reputation for integrity. He did not believe that money power was dangerous, except when it was in dangerous hands, and he did not regard his own as dangerous. So a quick thing we have, Morgan is the king of banking, Carnegie the king of steel, and Rockefeller the king of oil. The Force and Vanderbilt Railroads the force of circumstances brought Morgan and Carnegie into collision. By 1900, the canny little Scotsman, wearing, uh, weary of turning steel into gold, was eager to sell his holdings. Morgan had, meanwhile, plunged heavily into the manufacture of steel pipe tubing. Carnegie, cleverly threatening to invade the same business, was ready to ruin his rival if he did not receive his price. The steelmaster's agents haggled with the imperious Morgan for eight agonizing hours, and the financier finally agreed to buy out Carnegie for over $400 million. Fearing that he would die disgraced with so much wealth, Carnegie dedicated the remaining years of his life to giving away money for public libraries, pensions for professors, and other philanthropic purposes, in all disposing about $350 million. Morgan moved rapidly to expand his new industrial empire. He took the Carnegie holdings, added others, watered the stock liberally, and in 1901 launched the enlarged U.S. Steel Corporation. Capitalized at $1.4 billion, it was America's first billion-dollar corporation, a larger sum than the total estimated wealth of the nation in 1800. The Industrial Revolution, with its hot Bessemer breath, had come into its own. Rockefeller grows an American beauty rose. The sudden emergence of the oil industry was one of the most striking developments of the years during and after the Civil War. Traces of oil found on streams had earlier been bottled for back rub and other patent medicines. But not until 1859 did the first well in Pennsylvania, Drake's Folly, pour out its liquid black gold. Almost overnight, an industry was born that was to take more wealth from the earth and more useful wealth at that than at all the gold extracted by the 49ers and their western successors. Kerosene, derived from petroleum, was the first major product of the infant oil industry. Burned from a cotton wick and a glass chimney lamp, kerosene produced a much brighter flame than whale oil. The oil business boomed. By 1870s, kerosene was America's fourth most valuable product. Whaling, in contrast, the lifeblood of the ocean-roaming New Englanders since before the days of Moby Dick, swiftly became a sick industry. But what technology gives, technology takes away, and by, 19, by 1885, 250,000 of Thomas Edison's electric light bulbs were in use. Fifteen years later, perhaps 15 million. The new electrical industry rendered kerosene obsolete, just as kerosene had rendered whale oil obsolete. Only in rural America and overseas did a market continue for oil-fired lamps. Oil might thus have remained a modest, if uh, even a shrinking industry, but yet for another turn of a technological time. The in tide, the invention of the automobile, by 1900, the gasoline-burning internal combustion engine had clearly bested its rivals, steam and electricity, as the superior means of the automobile propulsion. As the century of the automobile dawned, the oil business got a new, long-lasting, and hugely profitable lease on life. Still in there, right? John D. Rockefeller, lanky, shrewd, ambitious, abstemious, he neither drank, smoked, nor swore, came to dominate the oil industry. Born to a family of precarious income, he became a successful businessman at age 19. One upward stride led to another, and in 1870 he organized the Standard Oil Company of Ohio, nucleus of the great trust formed in 1882. Locating his refineries in Cleveland, he sought to eliminate the middlemen and squeeze out competitors. Pious and parsimonious, Rockefeller flourished in an era of completely free enterprise. So-called piratical, uh, piratical pirate practices uh, were employed by the corsairs of finance, and business ethics were distressingly low. Rockefeller, operating just to the windward of the law, pursued a policy of rule or ruin. 
Sell all the oil that is sold in your district was the hard-boiled order that went out to his local agents. By 1877, Rockefeller controlled 95% of all the oil refineries in the country. Rockefeller, Rockefeller, as Carnegie had once called him, showed little mercy. A kind of primitive savagery prevailed in the jungle world of big business, where only the fittest survived. And so Rockefeller believed. His son later explained that the giant American beauty rose could, only be, could be produced only by sacrificing the early buds that grow up around it. His father pinched off the small buds with complete ruthlessness, employing spies and even extorting secret rebates from the railroads. He even, for, uh, he even forced the lines to pay him rebates on the freight bills of his competitors. Rockefeller thought he was simply obeying a law of nature. The time was ripe for aggressive consolidation, he later reflected. It had to come, though all we saw at the moment was the need to save ourselves from wasteful conditions. The day of combination is here to stay. Individualism has gone and never to return. On the other side of the ledger, Rockefeller's oil monopoly did turn out a superior product at a relatively cheap price. It achieved important economies both at home and abroad by its large-scale methods of production and distribution. This, in truth, was the tale of the other trusts as well. The efficient use of expensive machinery called for bigness, and consolidation proved more profitable than ruinous price wars. Other trusts blossomed along with the American beauty of oil. These included the Sugar Trust, the Tobacco Trust, the Leather Trust, and the Harvester Trust, which amalgamated some 200 competitors. The meat industry arose on the backs of bawling western herds, and meat kings like Gustavus F. Swift and Philip Armour took their place among the new royalty. Wealth was coming to dominate the Commonwealth. These untrustworthy trusts and the pirates who captained them were disturbingly new. They eclipsed an older American aristocracy of modesty, and modestly successful merchants and professionals. An arrogant class of the new rich, the nouveau rich, was now elbowing aside the patrician families in the mad scramble for power and prestige. Not surprisingly, the ranks of the antitrust crusaders were frequently spearheaded by the, quote, best men, genteel old family do-gooders, who were not radicals, but conservative defenders of their own vanishing influence. The Gospel of Wealth Monarchs of yore invoked the divine right of kings, and America's industrial plutocrats took somewhat similar stance. Some candidly credited heavenly help. Godliness is in league with riches, preached the Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts, and the hard-fisted John D. Rockefeller piously acknowledged that the good Lord gave me my money. Still Baron Andrew Carnegie agreed that the wealthy, entrusted with society's riches, had to prove themselves morally responsible according to a gospel of wealth. But most defenders of wide-open capitalism relied more heavily on the survival of the fittest theories of Charles Darwin. The millionaires are a product of a natural selection, concluded Yale professor and social Darwinist William Graham Sumner. They get high wages and live in luxury, but the bargain is a good one for the society. Despite plutocracy and deepening class divisions, the captains of industry provided material progress. Self-justification by the wealthy inevitably involved contempt for the poor. Many of the rich, especially the newly rich, had pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. Hence, they concluded that those who stayed poor must be lazy and lacking in enterprise. The Reverend Russell Conwell of Philadelphia, originally from Worthington, Massachusetts, became rich by delivering his lecture acres of diamonds thousands of times. In it, he charged, there is not a poor person in the United States who is not made poor by his own shortcomings. Such attitudes were a formidable roadblock to social reform. Plutocracy, like earlier slaveocracy, took its stand firmly on the Constitution. The clause that gave Congress sole jurisdiction over interstate commerce was a godsend to the monopolists. Their high-priced lawyers used it time and time again to thwart controls by state legislatures. Giant trusts, likewise, sought refuge behind the 14th Amendment, which had originally been designed to protect the rights of ex-slaves as persons. The courts ingeniously interpreted a corporation to be a legal person and decreed that, as such, it could not be deprived of its property by a state without due process of law. There is some questionable evidence that slippery corporation lawyers deliberately inserted this loophole when the 14th Amendment was being fashioned in 1866. Great industrialists likewise sought to incorporate in easy states like New Jersey, where the restrictions on big business were mild or non-existent. For example, Southern Pacific Railroad, with much of its trackage in California, was incorporated in Kentucky, because the regulations there were, were nil. That's why most of your credit card companies are stationed in Delaware, because there's very little taxes on credit card companies there. Government tackles the trust evil. At long last, the masses of the people began to mobilize against monopoly. They first tried to control the trust through state legislation, as they had earlier attempted to curb the railroads. Failing here, as before, they were forced to appeal to Congress. 
after prolonged pulling and hauling, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was finally signed into law. You want to pause and write that down. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was finally signed into law. The Sherman Act flatly forbade combinations in restraint of trade, without any distinction between good trust and bad trust. Bigness, not badness, was the sin. The law proved ineffective largely because it had only had baby teeth or no teeth at all, and because it contained legal loopholes through which clever corporation lawyers could wriggle. But it was unexpectedly effective in one respect. Contrary to its original intent, it was used to curb labor unions or labor combinations that were deemed to be restraining trade. Early prosecutions of the trust by the Justice Department under the Sherman Act of 1890, as it turned out, were neither vigorous nor successful. The decision in seven of the first eight cases presented to the Attorney General were adverse to the government. More new trusts were formed in the 1890s under President McKinley than during any other like period. Not until 1914, when the paper jaws of the Sherman Act fitted with reasonably sharp teeth. Until then, there was some question whether the government would control the trusts, or the trust to control the government. Think back to the, uh, the cartoon as the big trust in the Congress, right, looking over the small little senators. The argument was that the corporations are now beginning to control the government, and they can't get a hold, the government can't get a hold on the, on the businesses. The iron grip of monopolistic corporations was being threatened. A revolutionary new principle had been written into the law books by the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, as well as by the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. Private greed must henceforth be subordinated to public need. The South and the Age of Industry The industrial tidal wave that washed over the North after the Civil War caused only feeble ripples in the backwater of the South. As late as 1900, the South still produced a smaller percentage of the nation's manufactured goods than it had before the Civil War. The plantation system had denigrated into a pattern of absentee land ownership. White and black sharecroppers now tilled the soil for a share of the crop, where they became tenants in bondage to the landlords who controlled needed credit and supplies. Southern agriculture received a welcome boost in the 1880s when machine-made cigarettes replaced the roll your own variety and tobacco consumption shot up. James Buchanan Duke took full advantage of the new technology to mass-produce the dainty coffin nails. In 1890, in what was becoming a familiar pattern, he absorbed his main competitors into the American Tobacco Company. The cigarette czar later showed such generosity to Trinity College, near his birthplace in Durham, North Carolina, that the trustees gratefully changed his name to Duke University. Industrialists tried to coax the agricultural South out of the fields and into the factories, but with only modest success. The region remained overwhelmingly rural. Prominent among the boosters of the New South was the silver-tongued Henry Grady, editor of the Atlantic Constitution. His tirelessly exhorted the ex-Confederates to become Georgia Yankees and outplay the North at their commercial and industrial game. Yet formidable obstacles lay in the path of Southern industrialization. One was the paper barrier of regional state rate-setting systems imposed by the Northern-dominated railroad interests. Railroads gave preferential rates to manufactured goods moving southward from the North, but in the opposite direction they discriminated in favor of Southern raw materials. The net effect was to keep the South in a kind of third-world servitude to the Northern Northeast, as a supplier of raw materials to manufacturing metropolis, unable to develop a substantial industrial base of its own. A bitter example of this economic discrimination against the South was the Pittsburgh Plus pricing system in the steel industry. Rich deposits of coal and iron ore uh, near Birmingham, Alabama, worked by low-wage Southern labor, should have given steel manufacturers there a competitive edge, especially in Southern markets. But the steel lords of Pittsburgh brought pressure to bear on the comp compliant railroads. As a result, Birmingham steel, no matter where it was delivered, was charged a fictional fee, as if it had been shipped from Pittsburgh. This stunting of the South's natural economic advantages throttled the growth of the Birmingham steel industry. So regardless of where the Birmingham steel went, they would charge it as if it came from Pittsburgh, which would make it really expensive and take away any advantage that having steel in the South would be. So it, it prevented them from trying to compete with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not the football team, obviously. In manufacturing uh, cotton textiles, the South fared considerably better. Southerners had long resented shipping their fiber to New England, and now their cry was, bring the mills to the cotton. Beginning in about 1880, Northern Capital began to erect cotton mills in the South, larger in response to tax benefits and the prospect of cheap and non-unionized labor. In the process it still goes on today. The textile mill proved a mixed blessing to the economically blighted South. They slowly wove an industrial thread into the fabric of Southern life, but at a considerable human cost. Cheap labor was the South's major attraction for potential investors, and keeping labor cheap became almost a religion among Southern industrialists. The mills took root in the chronically depressed Piedmont region of the Southern Appalachia, and came to dominate utterly the communities in which they were located. 
Rural Southerners, virtually all of them white, for blacks were excluded from the almost menial jobs in the mills, poured out of the hills and hollows to seek employment in the hastily erected company towns. Entire families, often derided as hillbillies or lintheads, worked from dawn till dusk amid the whirring spindles. They were paid at half a rate of their northern counterparts and often received their compensation in the form of credit at a company store to which they were uh, habitually in debt. But despite their depressed working conditions and poor pay, many Southerners saw employment in the mills as a salvation, the first steady jobs and wages they had ever known. With many mills anxious to tap the cheap labor of women and children, mill work often offered destitute farm fugitive families their only chance to remain together. The Impact of the New Industrial Revolution on America Economic miracles wrought during the decades after the Civil War enormously increased the wealth of the Republic. The standard of living rose sharply, and well-fed American workers enjoyed more physical comforts than their counterparts in any other industrial nation. Urban centers mushroomed as the insatiable factories demanded more American labor, and as immigrants swarmed like honeybees to a new job. Early Jeffersonian ideals were withering before the smudgy blasts from the smokestacks. As agricultural declined in relation to manufacturing, America could no longer aspire to be a nation of small, freehold farms. Jefferson's concept of free enterprise, with neither help nor hindrance from Washington, was being thrown out the factory window. Tariffs had already provided assistance, but the long arm of federal authority was now committed to decades of corporation curbing and trust busting. <clears throat> Older ways of life also wilted in the heat of the factory furnaces. The very concept of time was revolutionized. Rural American migrants and peasant European immigrants, used to living by the languid clock of nature, now had to regiment their lives by the factory whistle. The seemingly arbitrary discipline of industrial labor did not come easy, and sometimes had to be forcibly taught. One large corporation simultaneously instructed its Polish immigrant workers in the English language and in the obligations of factory work schedules. I hear the whistle. I must hurry. I hear the five-minute whistle. It is time to go into the shop. I change my clothes and get ready to work. When the starting whistle blows. I eat my lunch. It is forbidden to eat until then. I work until the whistle blows to quit. I leave my place nice and clean. I put all my clothes in the locker. I must go home. Probably no single group was more profoundly affected by the new industrial age than women. Propelled into the industry into industry by recent inventions, chiefly the typewriter and the telephone switchboard, millions of stenographers and hello girls uh, discovered new economic and social opportunities. The Gibson Girl, a magazine image of an independent and athletic new woman created in the 1890s by the artist Charles Dana Gibson, became the romantic ideal of the age. For middle-class women, careers often meant delayed marriages and smaller families. Most women workers, however, toiled neither for independence nor for glamour, but for economic necessity. They faced the same long hours and dangerous working conditions as did their mates and brothers, and they earned less, as wages for women's jobs were usually set below those for men. The chattering machine age likewise accentuated class division. Industrial buccaneers flaunted bloated fortunes, and their rags-to-riches spouses displayed glittering diamonds. Such extravagances evoked bitter criticism. Some of it was envious, but much of it rose from a small but increasing vocal group of socialists and other radicals, many of whom were recent European immigrants. The existence of an oligarchy of money was amply demonstrated by the fact that in 1900, about one-tenth of the people owned nine-tenths of the nation's wealth. The nation of farmers and independent producers was becoming a nation of wage earners. In 1860, half of all workers were self-employed. By the century's end, two of every three working Americans depended on wages. Real wages were rising and times were good for workers who were working, but with dependence on wages came vulnerability to the swings of the economy and the whims of the employer. The fear of unemployment was never distant. A breadwinner's illness could mean catastrophe for an entire family. Nothing more sharply defined the growing difference between working class and middle class conditions of life than the precariousness of the laborer's lot. Reformers struggled to introduce a measure of security, job and wage protection, and provision for temporary unemployment into the lives of the working class. Finally, strong pressures for foreign trade developed as the tireless industrial machine threatened to saturate the domestic market. American products radiated out all over the world, notably the five-gallon kerosene can of the Standard Oil Company. The flag follows trade, and empire tends to follow the flag, a harsh lesson that America was soon to learn. In unions, there is strength. Sweat of the laborer lubricated the vast new industrial machine, yet the wage worker did not share proportionally with the employers and the benefits of the age of big business. 
The worker, suggestive of the Roman galley slave, was becoming a lever puller in a giant me mechanism. And individual originality and creativity were being stifled, and less value than ever before was being placed on manual skills. Before the Civil War, the worker might have toiled in a small plant whose owner hailed the employee in the morning by the first name and inquired after the family's health. But now the factory hand was employed by a corporation, depersonalized, bodiless, soulless, and often consciousness. The directors knew the worker not, and in fairness to the stockholders, they were not inclined to engage in large-scale private philanthropy. New machines displaced employees, and though in the long run more jobs were created than destroyed, in the short run the manual worker was often hard hit. A glutted labor market, moreover, severely handicapped wage earners. Employers could take advantage of the vast new railroad network and bring in unemployed workers from the four, four corners of the country and beyond to beat down high wage levels. During the 1880s and the 1890s, several hundred thousand unskilled workers a year poured into the country from Europe, creating a labor market more favorable to the boss than to the worker. Individual workers were powerless to battle single-handedly against giant industry. Forced to organize and fight for basic rights, they found the dice heavily loaded against them. The corporation could dispense with the individual worker much more easily than the worker could dispense with the corporation. Employers could pool vast wealth through thousands of stockholders, retain high-priced lawyers, buy up the local press, and put pressure on the politicians. They could import strike makers, called scabs, and employ thugs to beat up labor organizers. In 1886, Jay Gould reputedly boasted, I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. Corporations had still other weapons in their arsenals. They could call upon federal courts, presided over by well-fed and conservative judges, to issue injunctions ordering the strikers to cease striking. If defiance and disorders ensued, the company could request the state and federal authorities to bring in troops. Employers could lock their doors against rebellious workers, a procedure called the lockout, and then starve them into submission. They could compel them to sign, quote, ironclad oaths, or yellow dog contracts, both of which were solemn agreements not to join a labor union. They could put names on agitators on a blacklist and circulate it among fellow employers. A corporation might even own the company town with its high-priced grocery stores and easy credit. Often that worker sank into perpetual debt, a status that strongly resembled serfdom. Countless thousands of black and coal miners were born in a company house, nurtured by a high-priced company store, and buried in a company graveyard, prematurely dead. The middle-class public, annoyed by recurrent strikes, grew deaf to the outcry of the worker. American wages were perhaps the highest in the world, although a dollar a day for a pick-and-shovel labor does not now seem excessive. Carnegie and Rockefeller had battled their way to the top, and the view was common that the laborer could do likewise. Somehow, the strike seemed like a foreign importation, socialistic and hence unpatriotic. Big business might combine into trusts to raise prices, but the worker must not combine into unions to raise wages. Unemployment seemed to be an act of God, who somehow would take care of the laborer. Labor limps along. Labor unions, which had been few and disorganized in 1861, were given a strong boost by the Civil War. This bloody conflict with its drain on human resources put more of a premium on labor, and the mounting cost of living provided an urgent incentive to unionize. By 1872, there were several hundred thousand organized workers in 32 national unions, representing such crafts as bricklayers, typesetters, and shoemakers. The National Labor Union, organized in 1866, represented a giant bootstride by workers. The union lasted six years and attracted an impressive total of some 600,000 members, including the skilled, unskilled, and farmers, though in keeping with the times, it excluded the Chinese and made only nominal efforts to include women and blacks. Black workers organized their own colored National Labor Union as an adjunct, but their support for the Republican Party and the persistent racism of white unionists prevented the two national unions from working together. The National Labor Union agitated for the arbitration of industrial disputes and the eight-hour workday, and won the latter for government workers. But the devastating depression of the 1870s dealt in a, lockout, a knockout blow. Labor was generally rocked back on its heels during the tumultuous years of the Depression, but it never completely toppled. Wage reductions in 1877 touched off such disruptive strikes on railroads that nothing short of federal troops could restore order. So we had the National Labor Union and the Colored National Labor Union uh, being the first large-scale unions after the Civil War. A new organization, the Knights of Labor, seized the torch dropped by the defunct National Labor Union. Officially known as the Noble and Holy Order of the Knights of Labor, it began inauspiciously in 1869 as a secret society with a private ritual, passwords, and special handshakes. Secrecy, which continued until 1881, would forestall possible repri reprisals by employers. The Knights of Labor, like the National Labor Union, sought to include all workers in one big union. Their slogan was, an injury to one is a concern of all. 
A welcome mat was rolled out for the unskilled and uns skilled and unskilled, for men and women, for white and underprivileged blacks, some 90,000 of whom joined. The Knights barred only, quote, non-producers, liquor dealers, professional gamblers, lawyers, bankers, and stockbrokers. Setting up broad goals, the embattled Knights refused to thrust their lands into politics. Instead, they campaigned for economic and social reform, including producers, cooperatives, and codes for safety and health. Voicing the cry, the war cry, labor is the only creator of values and capital, they frowned upon industrial warfare while fostering industrial arbitration, negotiation, compromise. The ordinary workday was then 10 hours or more, and the Knights waged a determined campaign for the eight-hour stint. A favorite song of the years ran, Hurrah, hurrah for labor, it is mustering all its powers, and shall march along to victory with the banner of eight hours. Under the eloquent but often erratic leadership of Terence V. Powderly, an Irish-American nimblewit and fluent tongue, the Knights uh, won a number of strikes for the eight-hour day. When the Knights staged a successful strike against Jay Gold's Wabash Railroad in 1885, membership mushroomed to about three-quarters of a million workers. Unhorsing the Knights of Labor Despite their outward success, the Knights were riding for a fall. They became involved in a number of May Day strikes in 1886, about half of which failed. A focal point was Chicago, home to about 80,000 Knights. The city was also honeycombed with a few hundred anarchists, many of them foreign-born, who were advocating a violent overthrow of the American government. Tensions rapidly built up to a, the bloody Haymarket Square episode. Labor disorders had broken out, and on May 4, 1886, the Chicago police advanced on a meeting called to protest alleged brutalities by the authorities. Suddenly, a dynamic bomb, dynamite bomb was thrown that killed or injured several dozen people, including police. Basically, terrorism. Hysteria swept the Windy City. Eight anarchists were rounded up, although nobody proved that they had anything to do directly with the bomb. But the judge and jury held that since they had preached incendiary doctrines, they should be charged with conspiracy. Five were sentenced to death, one of whom committed suicide, and three others were given stiff prison terms. Agitation for clemency mounted. In 1892, some six years later, John At P. Altged, a German-born Democrat of strong liberal tendencies, was elected governor of Illinois. After studying the Haymarket case exhaustively, he pardoned the three survivors. Violent abuse was showered on him by conservatives, unstinted praise by those who thought the men innocent. He was defeated for re-election and died a few years later in relative obscurity. The eagle forgotten. Whatever the merits of the case, Elkgeld displayed courage in opposing what he regarded as gross injustice. The Haymarket Square bomb helped blow the props from under the Knights of Labor. They were associated in the public mind, though mistakenly, with the anarchists. The eight-hour movement suffered correspondingly, and su subsequent strikes by the Knights met with scant success. Another fatal handicap of the Knights was their inclusion of both skilled and unskilled workers. Unskilled workers could easily be replaced by strike-breaking scabs. High-class craft unionists, who enjoyed a semi-monopoly of skills, could not readily be supplanted and hence enjoyed a superior bargaining position. They finally wearied of sacrificing this advantage on the altar of solidarity with their unskilled co-workers and sought refuge in a federation of exclusively skilled craft unions, the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL. The desertion of skilled crafts unionists dealt the Knights a body blow. By the 1890s, they had melted away to 100,000 members, and these gradually fused with other protest groups of that decade. The AF of L to the fore. The elitist American Federation of Labor, born in 1886, was largely the brainchild of squat, square-jawed Samuel Gompers. This colorful Jewish cigar maker, born in a London tenement and removed from school at age 10, was brought to America when 13. Taking his turn at reading information literature to fellow cigar makers in New York, he was pressed into overtime service because of his strong voice. Rising spectacularly in the labor ranks, he was elected president of the American Federation of Labor every year except one from 1886 to 1924. Significantly, the American Federation of Labor was just what it called itself, a federation. It consisted of an association of self-governing national unions, each of which kept its independence with the AFOL unifying overall strategy. No individual labor as such could join the central organization. Gompers ado adopted a down-to-earth approach, soft-pedaling attempts to engineer sweeping social reform. A bitter foe of socialism, he shunned politics for economic strategies and goals. Gompers had no quarrel with capitalism, but he demanded a fair share for labor. All he wanted, he said, was more. Promoting what he called a pure and simple unionism, he sought better wages, hours, and working conditions. 
Unlike the somewhat utopian Knights of Labor, he was not concerned with his sweat, a sweet by and by, but with the bitter here and now. A major goal of Gompers was the trade agreement, authorizing the closed shop or an all-union labor. His chief weapons were the walkout and the boycott, enforced by We Don't Patronize signs. The stronger craft unions of the Federation, by pooling funds, were able to mass a war chest that would enable them to ride out prolonged strikes. The AFL thus established itself as on solid but narrow foundations. Although attempting to speak for all workers, it fell far short, far short of being represent, representative of all of them. Composed of skilled craftsmen like the carpenters and bricklayers, it was willing to let unskilled laborers, including women and especially blacks, fend for themselves. Though hard-pressed by big industry, the Federation was basically non-political. But it did attempt to persuade members to reward friends and punish foes at the polls. The AFL weathered the Panic of 1893 reasonably well, and by 1900 it could boast a membership of a half a million. Critics referred to it with questionable accuracy as the Labor Trust. Labor disorders continued, peppering the years from 1881 to 1900 with an alarming total of over 23,000 strikes. These disturbances involved 6,610,000 workers, with a total loss to both employers and employees of $450 million. The strikers lost about half their strikes and won or compromised the remainder. Perhaps the gravest weakness of organized labor was that it still embraced only a small minority of all working people, about 3% in 1900. But attitudes toward labor had begun to change perceptibly by 1900. The public was beginning to concede the right of workers to organize, to bargain collectively, and to strike. As a sign of the times, Labor Day was made a legal holiday by an act of Congress in 1894. A few enlightened industrialists had come to perceive the wisdom of, avoid of avoiding costly economic warfare by bargaining with the unions and signing agreements. But the vast majority of employers continued to fight organized labor, which achieved its grudging gains only after recurrent strikes and frequent reverses. Nothing was handed to it on a silver platter. Management still held the whip hand, and several trouble-fraught decades were to pass before labor was to gain a position of relative equality with capital. If the age of big business had dawned, the age of big labor was still some distance over the horizon. <laughs>